Finley broke the rules. I felt conflicted studying his pieces. Here's what I observed. There are three fundamentals of pen and ink rendering that Finley disrupts. The first and most disturbing to me is what he does with direction of light. For a pen and ink piece to turn out the way you want, you would plan the composition. The source of light is what informs you how to shade and give form to the elements. When I do a master study, I want to understand how each master made decisions and how they created effects so that I can apply these solutions in my own works. The first task when doing a study is to locate the source of light or multiple sources of light if backlighting is present. You find the source of light by locating the highlights and the deepest shadows. Following that logic, in this piece, we find highlights in the front of the lady on her face, neck, dress, and hand. The deepest shadow areas are in this general direction, except her hair and hair piece. The highlights are a bit off canter. On the fellow, his face is illuminated from a different direction and the shadows are here. The vines on the wall have no rendering, yet look at the cast shadows on these plants behind and in front of the lady. The shadow is equal in weight and going in the same direction. The balcony has highlights here, cast shadow here, so that sort of matches the lady's lighting. Let's see if the landscape can give us clues to the sources of light. It turns out the fellow's receiving bounce light from the balcony. Interesting, right? It's not obvious, however, as a viewer, we do unconsciously pick up on those little incongruities. There's a high level of finesse in Finley's mark making, yet something seemed off. It builds tension and an eerie sense of wonder, which makes sense for a horror pulp illustration. Another underlying rule of pen and ink is having control of values to guide the viewer through a composition. But before I get into that, I just want to give a shout out to FlexiSpot, today's sponsor. They kindly sent me their premium ergonomic chair, the C7 Pro to review, which I was keen to do because when I'm not standing at my drafting table, I'm sitting hours at my desktop. Ergonomics are important to my well-being and productivity. The box was so heavy. It's why I unpacked and assembled the chair in my entryway, which later proved to be a grave miscalculation since I still had to carry this beast two flights of stairs once assembled. So if you're building this chair solo and are not a power lifter, be more clever than me and carry the individual parts to the final destination before assembling your chair. The instructions were straightforward. It took me under an hour to build and set the ergonomics. It's a solid chair with ample possibilities for micro adjustments for various levels of comfort. The lumbar support is a bit intense to get used to, but if you want a second opinion, check out Ben's video. Overall, it is a quality, practical chair, so thank you FlexiSpot. Use code C730 for $30 off when you purchase your C7 chair. Now back to our composition. At first glance, Finley's use of values seems disorganized. He consistently combines an unruly blend of flat designs with fully rendered subjects on the same picture plane. In this composition, he did frame the subjects with a circular block of solid black. Where he goes off track is in the arrangement of values of the main subject. Apart from the highlights on this lady, he rendered each subject in a uniform tonal value. They're all in the same gray tone. The stars and the moon, which are flat graphical elements, they pull your attention away from the lady. They compete with the main subject. What is the main subject? Is it the lady or this oversized object? The arrangement of values in this composition, along with, again, that peculiar lighting, leaves your eyes skipping around the image with uncertainty. So I wondered if he organized his composition using the rule of thirds. Nope. The golden ratio? Aha! There it is. So he didn't use the values to grab our attention. However, the imaginative presentation of the elements is compelling. The third broken rule is, is mishmash of all manners of mark making. 
To maintain visual coherence and a sense of stability in the structure of a piece, masters will use two to three dominant techniques, maximum. Masters use line quality, varying the weight of the marks to establish depth, perspective, and dimension. The result of these combined techniques helps to orient the viewer. In this captivating piece, the sources of light are bouncing in the picture plane, and again, he's using his signature mix of flat designs combined with voluminous elements. Let's take a closer look at the rendering techniques he used. On the character in the forefront, solid white and solid black are used to create contrast. Finley chooses to control tonal value in this portion of the artwork, but everywhere else, the sections of solid black and elements of solid white are purely ornamental. What's even more curious about his mishmash of rendering techniques is that he did not soften the tone of the elements that are presumably positioned further in the picture plane. He chose to maintain the same intensity of marks on all three subjects. The cross-hatching and stippling used on the small man is the same weight and tonal density as the marks used on the dreamer and the floating lady. We can't rely on proportions of the elements to establish depth either. This lady could be closer to the dreamer in the forefront of the picture plane, or perhaps she's a giantess. Like in these images, the proportions are playful. These tiny flowers, they're all the same size, which implies that they're at an equal level in space as the floating lady. The flowers are flat, the lady's 3D, but they're on the same visual plane. You'll also note that the floating objects cast no shadows. These could result in chaos. However, the piece is effective because of how he overlapped the elements. There is coherence in the order going front to back, revealing hints that there is method in his madness. My discomfort with his rebellious style persisted as I inked a section of that same composition, mainly because of the mix of stippling and cross-hatching on a figure no less. I wasn't convinced that it would turn out, yet it was oddly satisfying to render like a sweet and savory snack. In terms of sequence, I outlined the flat graphics first since they overlap the figure. I used a large stiff beadball Hunt 513EF. Then I switched to a Hunt 512 bowl nib to render the entire face and head area. I couldn't tell how exactly he rendered the crosshatch. I started with lines that follow or contour the form, then crossed those lines on my second pass of hatches. I then proceeded to blend the tones, rounding out the forms with the stippling as he did, concluding the solid black background with a number two Kalinsky sable brush and Speedball Super Black India ink on bristle vellum paper. The artists featured on his channel are by request to show a fair mix of styles from a wide range of genres and eras. Even if one style is not your cup of tea, we can still make gains, at least in our observation skills. Virgil Finley certainly showed us that Learning the rules so you can break them is the true freedom of creating art. For more on Virgil Finley, check out Pete Beard's video. If instructions on how to do master studies sound helpful or for details on the flexi spot chair, all the links are in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, subscribe for more, and we'll see you in the next one.